two parameters and always returns its first parameter. False is a function that takes in two parameters and always returns its second parameter. So this is just the definition. And the, another important thing in here that we haven't talked about is when we say true is equal to this, we're not giving this function a name, true. Right? We have functions with no names. All we're doing is simple like mathematical equality, where everywhere we see true, we can completely replace it with this, and it's exactly the same thing. So the true, the T and the F symbols are really just shorthands for us to express this function here. And then we saw that we can use this true and this false to build up logical functions. So here we have an AND function, right? So we know we did the truth table. We know that and should only return true if both parameters are true. And so we saw that by constructing and defining our AND function like this as something that takes in two parameters, and where these two parameters are either going to be the true or the false that we define, we can then define AND. And we actually went out and saw exactly how we could calculate that yes, AND true and true returns true. The same with AND true and false, and AND false true, and AND false false. So we walked through all of these. Then we defined a not function, which takes in one truth value, true or false, and returns, if it's true, it returns false. If it's false, it returns true. It's exactly the not function that we would think. So that brings us up to now we have logic, right? Using and and not, we can define any of the other Boolean logics that we, want. we can do, ors, xors, whatever, any type of thing that we want using these functions, even using these functions. Or we could define new functions, but that kind of the idea there is it shows you a little taste of where we are and then where we're going. So now that we have this logic, we can express 
complicated Boolean equation, which is what we want. But in programming, do we just want Boolean expressions? What do we use Boolean expressions for? Conditions. What do conditions do? Yeah, so they allow you to change the execution flow of your program depending on the result of some Boolean expression. So how did how does how do Turing machines do branches? How are they represented? Yeah, so a Turing machine, right? Each state that the Turing machine is in, depending on what the current, what is currently pointed to by the head, if it's a one or a zero, it, it can do a different action. So it can take a different transition. So it can essentially read and then decide which way to move depending on that. So we need something similar here. We need some kind of branches, right? We want to be able to say, hey, if this expression is true, execute this true branch. If this expression is false, execute the false branch. So, our if statement, if we think about our if statement as a function, what should it take in? A Boolean logic, so some kind of Boolean. What else? A true branch and a false branch. This actually has a lot of parallels with your project five that you're doing, right? You are creating these data structures that represent if statements, right? This is a very similar thing here we need to do with if branches. So we want to be able to essentially say, if some condition C, then do A, otherwise do B. Right? So this is very basic. The idea is, and so in the kind of language we looked at for Hindley Milner, what would this if condition what would it return? Expression. Which expression? A or, B. a or B, depending on the condition. Right? So lambda calculus is going to use similar ideas. So here, we don't necessarily just want to execute A or B. We're going to return either the function A or the function B, whichever one it is. So what we want is some function like this. If C, then A, otherwise B. So if, in this case, it should be taking in how, three parameters, right? And depending on the condition, if the condition is true, it should return which parameter? The second one, A in this case. And if the parameter is false, which one should it take in? The third. So we want, essentially, if C is true, then return A. And if C is false, return B, right? This is the basic logic that we want from our if branches. And so the beautiful thing here is that, well, we're, our condition. So what was the semantics behind the way we define true? True takes in is a function that takes in how many parameters? One. Two. two. True takes in two parameters, and which one does it return? First. The first. So what is this branch? So if this is true, which one does it return? First one. If it's false, which one does it return? Which is basically the way we've defined true. So then we can actually define our if function essentially as the identity function. So it just takes that first argument and returns it. So we'll use that condition, whatever that condition is. If it's true, we'll choose A. If it's false, we'll choose B, based on the way we've defined true and false. Let's walk through an example. So we have if true a b. Right? So our if we're going to substitute out for lambda a dot a, just the identity function, right? We've seen this function many times. So we have a beta reduction here, right? We're going to substitute in this body, substitute all three a's in this body with t. What's that going to give us? T. T. So t. True, A, B, what's this going to return? A. A, based on the way we define true. And is that exactly what we wanted from the semantics here of if true, A, B? 
Similarly, with false, if false AB, well, we substitute if with the identity function. So we're going to substitute inside here all three A's with false. We, false, we do that, we have false AB. What's this going to return? B. So we basically, so I think a couple people asked some questions after class on Wednesday about why specifically true and false are defined this way. And I kind of said it's arbitrary in some sense. Right? You just have to, you have to define what is true or false and you have to use that to build everything up. But some of the benefits are here you have true that's basically doing the if function's job. Right? So this means your if function doesn't have to be complicated at all. Cool. Questions here? So that's it, branching. We got branching for free. Now things are going to get a little bit weird if they weren't already. Now we get into numbers. Something that seems so simple that you've been doing it all your life, right? You've been dealing with numbers, adding things. And yet here, now we have a language. Do we have, so think back to the syntax on lambda calculus. Do we have tokens for numbers? Can we write 10, 1, 0. Let's look. No, right? So an ID, so we're using ID very similarly to where, where we think about ID, how we've been defining it all throughout class. So it starts with an alphabetic character and then any number of alphanumeric. So even this is a simple 10, right? We can't, we can't define in our current lambda calculus. So earlier when we were saying plus, let's see, 10, 20, right? We can't even write this. This is not a valid lambda expression. And yet, I'm going to try to convince you that we can still do mathematical operations and we can still represent integers we will, but we'll probably, we'll use the tricks that we did in Boolean expressions and we'll represent them using functions. So basically we're going to create a one-to-one -one mapping from every number to a function. And it will be very clear by looking at the function, which number it is, and by looking at a number and figuring out which function it is. And so uh, I believe his first name is Alonzo. Alonzo Church is the one who created these numerals. So just like with Boolean logic, how you define your numbers, like how you define true and false, impacts how you define ands, ors, nots, if conditions. Similar thing here. We have to define numbers, and then we have to define operations on those numbers. How do we define addition? How do we define multiplication using these numbers? And so there may be other ways to represent numerals and numbers, uh, but we're going to go with the way that Church defined it. Uh, I don't have the exact date. I want to say sometime in the 40s, but so we can look that up. So, wait, let me, okay, there we go. So all of our numbers will be defined as functions that take in two things, two parameters, an f and an x. So 0 will just be x, which is the second parameter. So what does this make 0 equivalent to, alpha equivalent to, in what we've seen so far? What was that? I can't hear you, wouldn't you? Just x. What was that? Just x. Just x? False. False. So this is alpha equivalent to false, right? False took in two parameters and returned its second parameter. This zero takes in two parameters and returns its second parameter. Which, actually, when you think about it, makes a lot of sense when we think about how we use zero in programming languages, right? A lot of programs, you can do if 
with a number, even in C, right? You can say if zero and zero is false, then any non-zero value is true. I don't know whether that's the case. I don't think any non-zero value here will be true, uh, but we have that nice kind of symmetry here, which is pretty cool. Okay, so zero is false. I'm gonna kind of show you some and we'll build up. We'll see the pattern. So first you wanna see the pattern of what the numbers mean. And then later we'll try to go with why this actually works. And they're kind of, it's one of those things that's all interconnected. The numbers, the way they're defined, work because we can define addition and multiplication and subtraction. Well, subtraction is very difficult, but anyways. So one is going to be fx. So two takes in two parameters and applies the first parameter to the second parameter. That's it. Two is going to call f of x and then apply that to f. Three is going to do this three times. Tell me that you're starting to see the pattern. Four is going to be four. f of x, apply to f, apply to f, apply to f. So this is how we're defining numbers. So this is 0 through 4. And you can see that you give me any number. So I guess I should also preface here. We're not doing negative numbers. We're just focusing on 0 and above. Right? So you give me any number. Can you construct the function that represents that number? Yeah? You just keep doing lambda f dot x, and you keep applying f however many times. Ten, it'll be ten. If it's a hundred. There'll be a hundred of those f balls. It's gonna get very messy, but so now that we have so we have that pattern, and then we have to think the other way. If I give you a function, can you then go back to the number? So if it's in this form, could you go back and figure out which number that represents? Yeah. So that's, and it should never be the case, right, that two numbers map to the same, so we want a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So it should never be the case that two numbers map to the same function and two functions map to the same number. And I think you can convince yourself that, yes, this is the case because you keep adding Fs, they will be distinct functions. Cool. Questions on here? Okay. Numbers, functions, numbers. That's right. Cool. I did change these. These actually, these slides were wrong for like a good two semesters. I think it was only until the very last part of last semester that somebody mentioned that I had the parentheses wrong here. Which is a good point of disambiguation rules. If you leave this as f f f f f x, then that would mean these f's are grouped together, and then grouped together with the other f, and the other f, and the other f. That would be left associative. Right, but we don't want that. That's why we have to put the parentheses here. Cool. OK. So intuitively, what does this kind of mean? So if we have 4 AB, what this is going to be is basically A, use A, pass it B, the result of that pass to A, the result of that pass to A, the result of that pass to A. Right? So we're applying first B to A and then continually applying that result back to A, however many times the number is. <coughs> As to why this works, this is something that, like I said, is all connected. Right? If everybody get the numbers, how they look like at least, we're going to walk through these types of things. All right. So. The very first thing when we build up addition, well, we're building up numbers, we're going to build up first a successor function. So we want to say, give me one number, what's the successor to that? So that would be what's the next number? It's basically you can think of it as a plus one function. Right? What does it do is it adds one. So it should be that we give it zero, it should return one. When we give it one, it should return two. When we give it two, it should return three. Right? 
And so we'll see, we can actually use that as a building block to then build up addition. So we need a function that does this. So when we think about this, successor is going to take in one parameter where that parameter is a number, right? So it'll be one of those zero through whatever. So n here is the number. So the way it's defined here, it looks like it takes in how many parameters based on how we've talked about this. It looks like it takes in three, but if it looks like it takes in three and it takes in one parameter, then what's it going to return? A function which takes in two parameters. And what types of functions are numbers? Functions that take in two parameters, right? Which makes sense because it should be taking in a number and returning a new number. Right? So even though it looks like it's three, we'll see that what it returns is going to be a number where a number is a function that takes in two parameters. Okay. And so the way this function is written, we have f applied to n. What's n? What was that? It's an ID. It is an ID. Uh, in the context of this function, what does this parameter n represent? The number that we're trying to add 1 to. So we first take that number. We're going to pass in f and x. And so you can, so what is, so what is a number? So let's say 1, what is 1 f of fx? Right? So 1 is a function like this, and it's going to take return f of x. So then we have in here, wait, I'm going to parse these out. So if I have 1, doesn't matter, f of x, what's this going to return? So it's first going to substitute in here all the free f's with f, so this will be f. Then inside here, we'll replace all the free x's with x, so it'll return f of x. Right? So if I take this f of x, so if this is 1, this will be f of x. If I add another f around it in the body, what's this now the body of? 2. Right? So the way I've defined these 1 functions inherently means that this successor, because a successor function just basically wraps whatever it was around another call to f, which will then take us from 1 to 2. Because the only difference here is one additional call to f, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. So we can walk through this starting with 0. I think that's always good. You want to start with the base case to make sure your base case works. Right? So we have 0, lambda f dot lambda x dot x. So the successor of 0, expanding that out, is 0, lambda n dot lambda f dot x of f of n of f of x. And so I'm going to substitute in for this body all three ends with zero. Do I need to worry about renaming any of these f's or x's when I'm doing my substitution here? Why not? There's no free variables in zero, right? In the zero function, we know in here, there are no free variables here. Therefore, we don't have to worry about that at all. That's why I can leave it as this zero. Right? Because I know I can just plop that in, and at any point I can expand this zero out. Okay. So now we have lambda f dot lambda x dot f of zero fx. Now the question is, do we still have any more beta reductions to do here? How do we know if we have a beta reduction? We have we have an application. And what's important about that application? 
The left side is a lambda expression. So we have an application, right? We have zero applied with f. Is zero a lambda expression? An abstraction or a lambda expression? An abstraction, sorry. An abstraction? Yeah, so we have lambda f dot lambda x dot x. Right? So we have a possible app, uh, an application here. We have a beta reduction we can make. We can apply f to 0. So let's expand that out first. So we have lambda f dot lambda x dot x. Right? And so we're going to substitute inside here all three f's with f. There's no free f's in there. That's going to go away. And then we will substitute this x for this x. And so we'll get lambda f dot lambda x dot f x, which is what? One. This is exactly what we wanted. And so we've just shown that the successor of zero is one. And we can keep doing this. We can do this with one. We can do successor of one. We have the same thing. We substitute in for this n of, with one. We then expand out the one, and we say this is lambda f dot lambda x f of x. So applying that to f x, we'll return f x. And so the result here will be lambda f dot lambda x dot f of f of x, which is 2. So the successor of 1 is 2. And so this function defines, give me any number, I'll give you that number plus 1. So this actually shows that by starting with 0, you can actually just keep applying the successor function to generate all of the numbers. Right? So using this, we can define all the numbers. We can define them exactly this way. And we don't even have to use the kind of hand wavy logic I did where you say, OK, you can see the pattern here. Right? This, it tells you how to find the pattern. I give you the lambda expression for 0. I give you the successor function. You can now go build any number you want. Pretty crazy, right? All right, now we get to the fun thing of addition. Right, so we can do, we can have numbers. We can do numbers plus one. Now we want to add two numbers together. So what are some of the cases we want? We want adding zero and one to be one. So our add function, and we want, you know, add whatever you want. Add 1 and 2 is 3. So let's think about types of this add function. So what should this add function take in? How many parameters? Two. Two. It should take in two parameters and return what? One. What specifically should it return? The sum of it. Number. A number, right? From thinking about types. It should take in two parameters. Each of those parameters should be a number defined as we've defined the numbers. And it should return a number defined as we've defined the numbers. Cool. So again, it's going to look very weird because it has to return a function that takes in two parameters, which is how we've defined numbers. Right, so you can see that it's going to return a lambda f dot lambda x, which is how we've been doing numbers. So it's going to take in two numbers, an n and an m. And, it's, uh, and then it's going to return a lambda f dot lambda x. So that's all the number. And it's going to be n of f of m of f of x. So we've already kind of seen if m is 1, then what's this going to return? Fx. Fx. Just Fx. And so if n is 0 then, in that case, then we have 0, f, and f of x. And so if n is 0, which what's it going to return? Well, let's just walk through it. All right. I wanted to kind of high level that, but that's fine. Add 0 and 1. Right. 
We can expand out our add function. Lambda n dot lambda n, lambda n, lambda m, f of x, n f m f x. It's very quick. It's good. Uh, okay, so we're going to do these substitutions. So we're going to call this replacing all the n's in here with 0 and all the m's with 1. Right? So we have the 0, we have the 1. Good? Cool. So now how many beta reductions do we have in here that we could do? Two. We have two. We have the one with the f and the x, and the zero with the f and the other one. It doesn't matter which order we do these in, as we've said in this class. The order won't matter. Uh, let's do the middle one, the inner one here. So we have one of f of x. So we know what that's going to return is the first one applied that many times to the second parameter. So that's going to be one. So it'll be f of x. And now we have here zero f of f of x. So we said zero was the same as what? False. So false takes in two parameters and returns what? The second one. Second one. So what's this? What's zero f of f of x going to return? Yeah, f, of f of x. And what's lambda f dot lambda x dot f x? One. one. So we just did adding zero and one is one. Isn't that crazy? Do add one and two. We want to make sure that that works. So we have our numbers. Remember, these are standing in for the lambda expressions of one and two. Again, we're going to substitute the n and the m. So the n's going to go here, the m's going to go here. So we'll have one f two f of x. So what's two f of x going to return? Yeah, f of f of x. And so 1 of f of f of f of x is going to return what? Yeah, so let's step through that because that may not be clear. So this should be 3. It's not negative 3. This is just. So we can substitute out 1. So we have here. Let's expand out 1. Right? So here we have, we're going to replace inside here all the f's with f to call this first parameter. Correct? And in fact, since we're just focusing on this in here, let's completely ignore this part. Let's just look at it like this. Everybody good with that? Yeah? So we have first parameter and then second parameter. But we know we're left associative, so we always do the first parameter. So that we're going to substitute inside here every f with f. Cool. Now in here, so now we're going to replace inside here what with what? X with F of F of X, right? So let's step, let's do this one a little bit more straightforward. So we have this, we're going to substitute X with this. And we apply that to both sides. So we apply it to the f, doesn't change anything. And we apply this to the f, what do we do? Yeah, we just substitute it, right? There's nothing complicated here that we're doing. So that will be f applied to And so the final result is, which is which number? Three. We had one plus two. Let's go back to the addition. 
But why does this work? Oh. Zoom out. So let's think about this inside one. Right? So m is a number. We know a number is going to return its first parameter applied to its second parameter that many times. So if this m is 2, it will be f of f of x. If it's 3, it will be f of f of f of x. If it's 4, it will be 4 f of f of f of x. Right? And then when I apply here with this n, what is this one doing? Like, what does this mean? So when we have n of f of, let's say, whatever, alpha. We can call this alpha or something. Apply f that many times. Apply f that many times to alpha. So I've already applied f this many times to x. And then I'm going to apply f n more times, which is just going to add to it. So you can think of this m of f of x is going to return some f of f of x, right? whatever m is. In this case, it's 2. And so this n, because we're using this fixed f here, says apply f n number of times to this. So when we first get this inner result, how many f's are we going to have? m number of f's. And then now I'm applying how many more f's? n. So my final result will be m plus n number of f's applied to x. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I still look at this and it's like, how in the world did this person come up with this? Like, I don't, I don't know how many days of like whiteboards or probably chalkboards back then you had to have filled with this notation. Then you make like one mistake on thing, you gotta like go back and change it all. And don't even have a cell phone to take out and like take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But once you start kind of pulling it apart, right? And that's part of what we're trying to do here is build up a little intuition on what these numbers are and what they mean. And how they're used and how that's used then here to do addition. So subtraction is something we're not going to cover because apparently Church couldn't figure out how to do subtraction. He thought it may not have been possible. Um, and then it took somebody else to come up with how to actually do subtraction. But we can do something else that's really fun. Multiply. Questions on addition before we go on? So multiplication, as far as types go, is going to be similar to which function? Add. Yeah, right? Takes in two numbers and returns a number. Right? So we should expect a similar form. So when we see at whatever this one was, lambda n dot lambda m dot f of x, right? we should expect to see a similar type of definition. And so we we'll want to verify. We'll have the similar base cases. We want to multiply 0 and 1 to get 0. We want to multiply 1 and 2 to get 2. And we want to multiply, let's say, 2 and 5 to get 10. Right? And it should be the case. So the other way to think about it when we look at addition, did it matter what n and m were if we swapped the parameters? No, because we're applying f this m many times to x, and then we're applying f n more times. So that doesn't matter which order you do that in. You'll total end up with the same number of f's of f's of f's. Cool. So this is actually going to be kind of cool. So we're going to define multiplication in terms of addition that we already have. right? And the essence here is, now it's kind of nice. Now we actually don't have an inner x and y. We're just saying, take in two numbers. M and M, 
right? That makes this thing a little bit easier to understand. And so M do essentially, so what's this inner thing going to return? M. So this will add n, right, which will return a function that will add n to whatever its first argument is, right? And m times, we're going to add n first to 0, and then the result of that will be added to add n, and then the result of that will be added to add n, and the result of that will be added to add n. So we will add n how many number of times? m times, which is what was that? m times n. Yeah, which is going to be m times n. Right? What's another way to do it? You just add, so adding two, <coughs> multiplying 2 plus 5, another way to say that is add 5 to itself twice. Right? Add 5 to 0, you could say. So you have 5, and then take that result, add 5 to it again, you have 10, that's 5 times 2. Add 5 again, 15. that's 15, 5 times 3. And you can keep doing that, right? So we can step through this. We have multiply 0 and 1. So we know this should return 0. Yes. Right? So we have lambda n dot lambda m, m add n 0 with 0 and 1. So we're going to replace in here all the free n's with 0 and all the free m's with 1. So we have 1 add 0, 0. And so with 1, 1 is a function that takes in two parameters and returns the first parameter applied once to the second parameter. So this will be add 0 to 0 which this will return zero. Yes? Now that we've defined uh, the function add, are we able to use it in the way that you have it listed there? Or if yes. You, if you said, like, okay, write a multiplication function, you want us to write out the 12 characters that make up an add function? Or? No, you can use it like this as long as you're doing it correctly, right? Correct. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, you should always, you know, if you can use these symbols, that makes it a lot easier to understand semantically what you mean. Um, but if you're using them incorrectly, then you know, you've got other problems. OK, let's look at a more interesting example. Multiply 1 and 2. So we have our same thing in here. We have the definition of multiplication. And we can see substituting 1 in for the n and substituting 2 in there. So we're basically going to do first add 1. So Remember, the way we define numbers applies the first one, f of x, and then f of that result. So this is the same as add 1 to 0, and then add 1 to that result. So we have add 1 and 0, which is going to return us 1. And we have add 1 and 1, which is going to return us 2. So now we get to 2. So, and like I said, you can build up subtraction, and then I think when you have subtraction, you can do division, which is pretty crazy. Um, so now with this, we have pretty much the basics of a very hard to write programming language, but we still have, what do we have here? What have we defined in this language? We have functions. application, we can call functions. And then using those two primitives, right? That is all the language provides. What have we been able to construct on top of that? Arithmetic. What else? Boolean. Yeah, Boolean logic. Branches. We have branches. Right? So using all these, we've been able to construct all of these things. The question is that the question I want you to think about and I want to talk about now right at the end is, is that 
enough. Can you do everything you could do in a program now using what we have? Another way to think about that is, is it Turing complete, right? Can you do everything you can do on a Turing machine in Lambda Calculus with what we've defined? What can't you do and why? Looping. So what's the purpose of looping? Yeah, it allows us to kind of go back to an earlier instruction, right, and say start doing this. So why doesn't our language, why doesn't Lambda Calculus have loops? Yeah, right now we don't have any recursion, right? We don't have any way for a function to call itself, right? Which is also a form of looping. Why don't we have a way for functions to call themselves? What's lacking in our language that you're used to? The ability to terminate itself? Stack? We don't have any I'll let somebody else help you out. What was that? No names. No names. Our functions don't have names. Uh, right? Normally, the way we do recursion in our programming language is, is we say define some function foo, and then that means that inside foo we can call itself. Right? We can say call foo again. Right? But here, in this language we have, we have no names. Now, am I lying to you because I just defined an add and a multiply function? What is that? What is it? Yeah, it's a definition, right? That's the key difference. Is I'm defining molt as <coughs> whatever the definition is here, right? I'm defining multiply as this, and I've defined add as that, but part of recursion, or part of self-referential, is we can't use that same definition in the definition, right? Here I'm saying, what I'm essentially saying is anywhere you see multiply, you can completely replace it with the thing on the right. Like exactly. It's like kind of like a macro you could fill in. Right? So if that macro itself had multiply in it, you would never be able to write out the final lambda expression. So we do not, so this, even though it seems you know, a little bit counterintuitive where I say there's no names, but I'm giving things names, I mean that in the language itself, there is no way to say define this function foo and then call foo inside of itself. So, we have Boolean logic, we have true and false branches, we have arithmetic, and so the problem is, like we've talked about, we have no way to do loops, right? We have no way to do recursion yet. So we can't write something like the factorial function. We can't do something that is like factorial zero is one, factorial of n is n times factorial of n minus one, right? One of the most basic recursive definitions that we study in computer science. Right, is this is how you calculate the factorial function. And in code, it's very easy because we can call factorial from inside its own body. And part of that is that this function, this lambda expression has a name, right? This function has a name that we can use inside of itself. So the key question to think about is, does this mean that lambda calculus now has completely failed? Do we need names? Are names an inherent part of being able to do recursion in a language that has only functions. So, so where are we at? I think we still got a couple minutes. Okay, so the idea is how would we write this factorial function in lambda calculus? So we already have the basic building blocks, right? We already have ifs, right? We have if statements. One thing we need, is, we already have multiply. We'd also need subtract. And we need equality. So let's say we have a uh, function is zero. So we have some function that will check if something's zero. If it's zero, it returns true. If it's false, it returns false. That's something we could easily write. Um, we also, let's assume we have a predecessor. So like the successor is plus one, predecessor is minus one. All right, let's assume that we have that. Then we want something like this, right? This would be a direct translation of that program into lambda calculus. So factorial is lambda n if 
n is 0, return 1. Otherwise, multiply n with factorial of the predecessor of n. Right? So multiply n times factorial, multiply n times factorial of n minus 1. Right? But the problem is we cannot write this function, even though this seems incredibly simple, because of this factorial. We're using factorial inside there. So this is not a definition. Right? This is a recursive definition. So it's going to come down to what the super cool thing we'll get into on Wednesday is the Y combinator. So it turns out there is a way to do recursion in a language without names, which is crazy. So we thought the calculus, the numeric stuff was crazy. It's about to get even weirder.